Welcome to the Bass Reese Gun Club podcast, where we discuss all things firearms and shooting sports. I'm your host, Antonio Hicks, and I'm excited to bring you the latest news, tips, tricks, and historic discussions about guns in the minority community. We're a pro Second Amendment community of responsibly armed citizens, and we take pride in learning and sharing our knowledge within a community. So whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, this podcast is for you. So sit back, relax, and let's dive in. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the psychological impact of guns in our community. Do guns create a sense of safety or a cycle of fear? We'll be exploring this topic with experts in the field and hearing from community members who have been impacted by gun violence. Stay tuned for an insightful and thought-provoking conversation. They'll stop it. They will absolutely stop Individually? it. Individually? Or are you talking about the whole department? The whole department. They'll stop it. When, 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 they, when, they, when, they ha- when the police department, when the police chief or the commissioner realizes that every time one of his officers at a traffic stop slams a kid's head into, into the door mm-hmm. for no reason, okay, that he's going to have to come out the, the city or the county or really, if you really want to make it nasty, make it come out of the pension fund. That's what I was just about yeah, to say. Yeah, I was going to say, because it has to come out of that. Because, yeah. I mean, they pay out. They do payouts all the time. No, they don't. See, that's the thing. They no, move, insurance they, pays. Yeah, so insurance companies yeah. do it. That's number one. But number two, you know, for every successful suit that you see or payout that you see, mm-hmm. statistically, there's about 15,000 that are brought that fail. So you're saying every single one is brought up. Well, think about it. I mean, you know, if if they know, because the simple fact of the matter is I, I know a young woman who's my colleague and she does defense work for the cities and municipalities and she'll tell you, she's like, we we fight, 97% of the cases we fight based on immunity, not on the merits. So we know we're wrong. Mm-hmm. We know we're wrong, but we know that the laws that are in place protect us and insulate us. So if you're looking, because now, if you take away police, if you take away police's sense of entitlement because of immunity, now what do you have less to worry about? White folks can't weaponize the police like that now. Because when the police come out, they got a whole different set of rules to follow. Why? Because the police chief said, I'm tired of paying these lawyers every single time y'all decide to do something stupid. Mm -hmm. So the culture changes now. My former law partner, he was former law enforcement on the federal level, okay? He used to be a part of the Border Patrol and the Federal Air Marshals. One of the things he told me, he said that the United States Border Patrol guys down on the southern border, they used to have this nickname for Mexicans. You know what they called them? Mm. They called them Tonks. You know why they called them Tonks? Because that was the sound that was made when you hit them upside the head with the flashlight. Wow. That's crazy. And I'm not even Mexican. That's crazy. But I still feel some type of way about that. Yeah. But that is indicative of the culture that happens. That's indicative of the culture that happens inside these departments, which leads to these police officers acting with a sense of impunity, mm-hmm. which encourages these other groups to weaponize them against us. Mm-hmm. Now, what if all of our communities start weaponizing themselves? Everybody own gun. Everybody own guns, mm-hmm. and we start doing what these white militias were doing, are still doing to this day. So when people come into our neighborhoods, we would prevent that kind of stuff from happening. Mutually assured destruction breeds civility. I agree. I think about what the the, the example you gave, Sean, about the fifty people um, ruling over three hundred something people Mm -hmm. if everybody had a way to protect themselves it wouldn't have gone down that same way if everyone exercised their right to protect themselves right so as a woman i think about my family earlier in the in this podcast we asked about we talked about family and friends looking at you crazy and a lot of my family members are anti-gun and now they'll ask me well what do you need that for and I'm like okay so I'm out in the street and someone tries to take my life what do you want me to do right what do you expect me to do I do it to protect myself exactly Mm -hmm. they want they want you to pray and the funny thing is when stuff gets crazy they'll say Kia can you help us 
Mm. So they, they're, you know, they question you because they don't get it, but they know when their back is against the wall, they know what they need to do. I, had a, I, I taught a firearms class one time, a rifle course, and I had a woman, she was extraordinarily, you know, big on, you know, the power of prayer. Mm-hmm. And her husband, her husband brought her to the class, and she was big on. Well, I don't need to do this because you know, you know, Jesus is going to protect me and all these different things. That's that's my mother. So this is what I did. I'll tell you what I did. Where I got it from, I don't know, but in the back of my truck, I had, and I think I was cleaning out one of my offices. I had a, a telephone book, mm-hmm. <laughs> one of those old yellow pages that was really thick. Wow, and so. I put the telephone book and I duct taped it to a post and I put a target behind it. And I walked back 15 yards and I shot at the telephone book and then moved the telephone book and showed the holes in the target. And I told her, I said, okay, now this is what I want you to do. We're going to go ahead and duct tape your Bible to this post and I want you to go stand behind it. (laughs) She didn't want to do it. See if prayer was going to stop the bullet. I said, you, you, I said, you're not a believer. You're not a <laughs> believer. You, you backsliding. You're not a believer. That's just you. you <laughs> What'd she say? She was quiet. She was quiet. Because she, she, and it was funny because her husband was like, I told you about that Bible shit. I told you. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he said. Right? Right. So again, but one of the things is that as a community, mm-hmm. you know, we have to embrace reality. We can't shy away from it. Um, I tell young people in my community all the time. I mean, but reality, too, it was violence in the Bible. Yeah. John, listen, John 2.15, I believe, had Jesus driving people out with a whip. And but, flipping over tables. And flipping over flipping tables. Over tables. Yeah. Right? And I'm not, I'm not a biblical historian or scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but I know that one. Many groups of God's people defended themselves. They defended their nation. They yeah. defended their property. Yeah. They built walls. They, they went took over to land, war. but yeah. they conquered too. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, I tell people all the time. I say, you know, a lot of times it's about us being detached from reality. And I tell younger people all the time. I say, there's one word that you can use to describe a person who's detached from reality. Vulnerable. But or all this, with all that we've said and everything that's been going on today. And we've seen the George Floyds. We've seen all the people that have suffered from just random violence. Why do we still have that fear of, about us, in your opinion? It, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's because of that docility. Mm-hmm. And, again, this is not a new problem. This has been happening since, hell, since Reconstruction. No, no, I'm sorry. This is actually a kind of a modern problem. I won't, I won't take it back, in my, in my opinion, maybe to the 60s when... I call it the liberalization of, of black America, where we, the, the, I don't like to really put it to politics, but I have to in this case. A lot of us, again, we're not a monolith, but a majority of us vote that way. Mm-hmm. And the people that vote that way are usually anti-firearm. And what they'll tell you is, look at what firearms have done to your community. Mm-hmm. Look at the 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 deaths, look at all of this stuff, and you shouldn't have a firearm. In my opinion, it's, a, it's, it's controlled opposition because the opposite is, hey, you should have a gun. You know, so they're telling us you shouldn't have a firearm. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't try to defend yourself. And, and we're sitting here because of our docility, because of our conditioning in this country. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I am looking around. And you know Pookie and Ray Ray, they, they shot at each other. And, and, and two-year-old baby got killed. And all this other this, this, this stuff that unfortunately happens. But we keep believing that we aren't in power to, to defend ourselves. While the other side is encouraged to fight a well-armed militia. And the other side is is told to say, um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's 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 two sides of the same damn coin. I think you just said something, and it made me think of this. They're you're saying they're telling us you shouldn't have a firearm. Look at all of the uh, gun violence in your community. Mm-hmm. But yet, I'm gonna go there for a second. Sorry for some of my brothers and sisters that's listening to this. If you were to sit there and say, do you hang out with those people? Do you know those type of people? All these people that are committing these, these um, atrocities, 
all of us would say, no, I don't hang out with people like that. No, I barely know anybody. Yeah, my, I got a cousin that's in, 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 you know, in prison. Yeah, one. But on a daily basis, I don't hang out with people like that. I don't know people like that. So why are you telling me that I shouldn't have a gun because of those people are bad? Mm-hmm. See, it's like, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's Jedi mind tricks. Mm-hmm. You don't need a gun. Bad people have guns. You're black and bad people have are black and they have all the uh, mm-hmm. uh, gun violence in the community. And that's, a, and that's another issue, though, is this whole good or bad paradigm, right? right? So, you know, last time I checked, the bad people are winning. They, it's historical. That yeah, let's, let's, go ahead and, right. let's go ahead and talk about it. Like, you know, there's winners and there's losers. There's winners and losers. You can sit up there talking about good and bad all you want. But right now, we in the loser's locker room. Mm-hmm. We in the loser's locker room. So, you know, ultimately, you know, while we want to have conference, look, again, you have to, there is, there is intellectual dishonesty that is put forth towards our community mm-hmm. that gives us a certain conditioning. That's always been the case. However, we have to be honest with ourselves, right? Right. You can't tell me about how, how smart you are, how insightful you are, how much wisdom you have, and not be able to see the idiocy that's being presented from you, to you, especially when you have the benefit of 400 or 500 years of hindsight. Mm-hmm. So to that point, this is what bothers me. Do you not see what has happened to our people over the course of, like you said, a half a millennia in this country, hell, in the world, that you, you think that I'm going to say, well, my oppressors or, or former oppressors or uh, the, 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 the children of my oppressors had firearms, believe in, in owning firearms, conquered a whole ass nation with those firearms. Mm-hmm. And you're sitting here telling me that I, I'm, gun's bad. You don't need them. No. I always ask a question with us as a people. When do we get to say, I will never again? When do we get to say, I will never again? When, as, as Brother Sean says, when we stop being losers, I guess. We're in the losers locker room. And we could have all the tools to our access. Mm-hmm. As an American citizen... I have the right to pick up this firearm to defend myself. No, not to go rob anyone, not to go rape anyone, not to steal, but to defend myself. And someone's telling me, okay, we're in a battle, but you can't use that even though technically you have every right to it because that's bad. That's not good for you. They're throwing rules on you that they don't even use themselves. Once again, Jedi mind tricks. We need to wake the hell up. Wake up. I'm tired of being defined by the the less again, I hate saying this. This is those uncomfortable conversations, like you said. I'm tired of being defined by the less of us and the less of what we do. Mm-hmm. To, but being but in and that being used as a narrative against us. It's well, it's is are there tools that we can use though outside of firearms? Well, like, let's say somebody's really uncomfortable with owning a, a gun itself. In your food. Because you don't have to like it. Mm-hmm. You just have to do it. To be honest with you, you know, people, have a, people don't believe me when I say this, but I'm not a gun lover. Yeah. I'm not a gun. Guns to me are like kitchen knives. They're tools. They're tools. Yeah. Absolutely. I got, a, I got a DeWalt power drill downstairs. I got a Milwaukee tape measure. I got an AR-15. They're tools. For different purposes. I'm I not don't a, name them. Yeah, I don't I, fetishize them. I just use yeah, them. Yeah, I just use them. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, just, like, just like kitchen knives and your microwave, you might not like cooking, but unless somebody's going to do it for you, you're going to starve. <laughs> and as we've seen, nobody is going to protect us. Nobody is going to protect us. And because even those that ostensibly are protecting us, it's been shown time and time again that they have ulterior motives mm-hmm. and they're playing the long game. So, you know, at some point, you're uncomfortable using firearms. Okay, cool. I can respect that. But you better go ahead and pick this thing up when it's necessary. Or 
except the fact that you're food. You know, you got now yeah. let me ask you. Let me ask my two fellow panelists. I'm at the point where I've just stopped trying to convince people. Mm-hmm. I've just said, "Well, that's cool. I understand that. Just don't limit my my access and my rights to that." Have you guys? Where are you guys at that in, in this point? And I'm sorry I, to take over like that. I'm sorry. No, um, I wanted to say just to give you a quick overview of my story. Me and my husband were minding our business. Our neighbor knocks on our door and said, you might want to be careful. I just got robbed by gunpoint. His wife was pregnant, and his wife wanted something to drink or something, whatever. He went out to go get her whatever he needed. It was late on a Sunday evening, about 9, 10 o'clock, and some man came out the bushes and took his keys, took his car, took his wallet. And my husband said, thanks, brother, for letting us know. And my husband said, we're going to the range. And I was like, no, and I hated it. (laughs) I was that woman that would go to the range and cry. I would run out of the, you know, out of the range. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to hold my gun. I didn't want to touch anything. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. But it was something that I realized that I had to do. And that whole time I kept saying, how am I going to do this? I need to learn how to protect myself. I would have never, ever, ever in my life thought that I would become a firearms instructor. So when I tell women why I do it, I say, because that man that's coming towards you is not coming to give you a hug. He's not. Whether you pray and ask Lord Jesus to protect you, whether you run, your man isn't there, your husband isn't there, you are there by yourself or you're with your mama or with your babies and those people coming towards you are not coming there to do right by you. You need leverage and it is your American right as a citizen to protect yourself with a firearm. It is a tool, just as my brother said. It is a tool. If I sat a firearm down on this table right here and walked away, came back in five years, it wouldn't have shot anybody. It's not the tool. It's the fool. And it's what you do with that tool. You can take a hammer, forget a gun. You don't want a gun, you can take a hammer. I can build a house or I can knock somebody upside the head and kill them. It's a tool. And if we start understanding that as American citizens, we have the right to use those tools in order to be um, contributing positive Mm -hmm. members of society against the people that are winning, you know, the bad guys out there, then maybe more of us would do it. Well, when you've been programmed, going back to that word, docility, You've been programmed your entire life to, to kind of think that you're not a citizen. You've been told that you're, you were just basically, you were, you were the descendant of, of, a, of a slave. Uh, you can't, I, can't, I can't buy that because those same people that say that will go ahead and show up and stand in line for four hours to vote for somebody when they vote don't count. So mm-hmm. either you're a citizen or you're not. Well, I'm, what, I'm is, no, what I'm saying is, no, what I'm saying is, no, what I'm saying is, you've been programmed, citizen. you've been programmed your entire life to say, to think either consciously or un- unconsciously that you are you are you know you're less than yeah. Yeah. and and you you're told yeah you're an american citizen but but, but yeah. you're, you're 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 this but or or you know and and you don't feel like an american it's you not feel for you. like it's yeah. not for you you feel like you feel like okay i don't feel like i'm 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 supposed to protect my the the you know the the one thing i always hear brother is well the second amendment was for white people and it's like yeah, but, you know, I tell you what, above the Second Amendment is that thing that you was talking about earlier, that the right to defend yourself, the right to defend your mm-hmm. life, liberty, and hell, the pursuit of happiness. I mean, but there are real fears, though. But I think we need to come together as a community because they've had, we've had many examples where, you know, us as gun owners have walked down the street with our rifles on our chest and have gotten pulled over by the cops and damn near killed. But I think if we came together as a community, if we saw stuff like that, and I mean, just to go back to George Floyd, if we saw one of our brothers on the floor getting choked out and the guy was just sitting there, if all of us came out without weapons, I think the cops would have pulled away. Yeah, it's a different, it's a different ball game when we talk about individual versus team tactics. Team tactics rule the day. And doing things as a collective in, in the combative sense is typically far more effective than doing things singularly. Hell, um, January 2nd. I mean, January 6th showed us that. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, the thing about it is for me, you know, in terms of do I feel the need to convince people? Mm-hmm. 
No. Yeah. You know, because, you know, what's the phrase? A person convinced against their will is of the same as opinion. opinion. Still. Say, that, no, say that. Say that clear and slightly. Those against you, those those, those who are convinced, convinced against, against their will are remain remain having the same opinion still. God, right? I've so, never heard that. That's yeah, great. It's, a, it's like you know, so. That's the thing. So I don't feel the need to you know convince people, um, but there's certain things there's certain things that people can't say to me. Right? There's, certain, there's certain things that people can't say to me. Like, you know, when, when the pandemic happened and everybody was out there panic buying, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. all of those people that was voting blue and voting for gun control was right here at Stoddard's trying to buy. Emptying out the place. Right. Yeah. Buying stuff that they had no idea how to use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You done bought six pistols. What you going to do with six pistols? You one person. Right. You can only, you're only using one at a time unless you Yosemite Sam. <laughs> you know, or you in a John, or you in a John Woo movie, yeah, right. So the re the reality is that when when it hits the fan, you know, in any sense of the word, I I don't I don't want to hear it. I have plenty of people. I had plenty of people come. Can you show me how to use it? No, not now. I don't have the time. Right, I'm I'm busy defending my family. Right, because I told because I right because I told I told you I told you three yeah. years ago, yeah. four years ago. To go ahead and, and start doing this. But now it's, oh, you know, your your procrastination does not equal my emergency. Mm -hmm. Their comfort had not been fully disturbed until it hit the fan. Mm -hmm. You know? It doesn't it you know, what's in it for me? Why should I bother? Okay, guns, okay, that's fine. That's for them. You know, that's for your robbers, thugs, whatever, gang members. Mm. Okay, and, that's, and has police. nothing to do with me. And and the yeah. you know, mm -hmm. the bad apples and da 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 da. Then when it knocked on their doorstep, mm -hmm. all that talk about nonviolence went out the door. I got calls. Kia, when's your next class? Kia, can I borrow? One of your guns. <laughs> what? What? No. Oh, yeah. you, I don't know who y'all no, know. I know. Can calls. you borrow? Oh, sugar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't borrow like, okay, my he, he, AR. Yeah, yeah. No. Not knowing how to use it. Yeah. And that's and that's that's just a simple reality. Um, you know, when people, and it's, it goes back to what I said earlier about discomfort. You know, as long as people are comfortable, a lot of times they don't do the. They don't do the things that they need to do to prepare themselves for, you know, uncomfortable situations. And that's just and that's just the way it is. But Yeah, I think the biggest fear came out of the uh mass shooting they had up in upstate New York. In the supermarket. Yeah, the supermarket. It was in Buffalo, I think yeah. it was. But and before that we had Charleston. Yeah, and, and, had Char and that, that was before the pandemic and, and that was that didn't change anything as yeah. far no. as what our perception of who our enemy is. Right. It didn't. But it did change a lot of churches because I do work with a lot of pastors mm -hmm. and they're getting their security, you know, teams going. We'll, you know, do church trainings, um, at least for the security teams. They have a desire to at least start becoming, um, a, you know, having situational awareness, putting together some sort of plan. That guess, did happen, but the actual congregation, nah. I guess they don't believe Jesus is saving them either, huh? But. Yeah, man. So I guess they can give me my ten percent back. Look, look. Because <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying that if Jesus saves, why are we doing that? So, but that, like that's that's the conversation. I know it's going to be a whole bunch of Bible beaters. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. But you got to look at it. But they say it. Yeah, yeah, you gotta, they, yeah. You gotta, you gotta look at it. Reality, people. It's reality. You, if you are detached from reality, you are probably going to be a victim or dangerous. That's that's just yeah. what, that's just what it is. And so, for for us, you know, you asked about you know what if how is it done outside of firearms? I'm a strong believer in the idea that foundational respect amongst animals is predicated upon. A mutual recognition that parties can defend themselves. Foundationally, when you and I as men have a conversation, mm -hmm. there are certain lines that we are likely not to cross because we understand that if we do, 
there will be physical consequences that we do not necessarily want to deal with. Right. 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 But you can. Right. But the history. And you are more than capable of doing it. Right. So that keeps you as a responsible two men having a conversation mm -hmm. not to take it there because you know you're both capable right. of breaking some bones. But, right. for, but for us as a community, historically, the things that have been done to us have always been done to us for free. So we've always allowed it to be free. So there's no reason for I'll tell you a personal story. My wife's family is from the deep country. They own probably a couple hundred acres of land. They live four miles from the plantation that owned their family in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I was at their house a couple weeks ago, and I, I told her aunt, I said, I can't respect y'all. Because y'all just going to the Starbucks with this guy? <laughs> like, your kids are going to school with his kids and everything is okay? They playing hopscotch? And he's so bold, he still has a lot of the things, the torture devices and things that were used all in his house and keeps it as a museum, charge people money to go in there. You can look it up right now on, on the internet. So the same slave collar that he put, that his grandfather or great-grandfather put on your great-grandfather is sitting in his living room. And you okay was shopping at the same store as this guy. What would you have them do? What would I have them do? Mm -hmm. Burn the <laughs> motherfucker down. I'm sorry, are we, are we allowed to cuss? Well. I would say. <laughs> sorry. I just, I was, I'm sorry. I didn't, didn't I mean, I will, I will, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Sean, go ahead and mean to interrupt yeah. you, man. Okay. Go ahead, brother. So, I, will, right. I will say this. Because this is a public forum, mm. I won't go into detail to that extent. But yeah, we don't I, wish no harm. But what, I, but what I will say is that Edit. it can't it can't be free. If you do something against our people, you have to understand that that's going to cost you. And that is why I like the verdict in Clayton County. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think it would have gone differently had he had a firearm and he shot her? Oh, great question. I'm gonna let the uh, lawyer answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Venue is very important. And when I say venue, in, in the law, we basically mean where is the case being tried? What county is it being tried in? That's what we mean by that. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason why that's important is because that dictates the, the jury pool, what we call the veneer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you select your pool from during voir dire, which is jury selection. So in Clayton County, if he would have shot at her, you know, I think he's going to jail. Even despite, you know, the population and the jury composition, mm -hmm. because black people in this country have a tendency to automatically cede to white authority. Mm -hmm. Right? Subconsciously we, too. Right. Yeah. I mean, we have we have this conditioning that the white man's ice is always colder. And we make decisions predicated on that. So this just happened to be a situation where, you know, you had to have all of the stars aligned to make sure you got a decent shot at justice. But if any of those things would have been out of place, if they could have found any reason really to blame it on him or put him in the wrong, yeah. I think he would have got away with it. Because you thought he was defending himself? Well, I mean, per Georgia State law, he was defending himself. <laughs> Let me tell you something. We have a saying in law school, mm -hmm. right? If you, you know, if you want justice, go to a whorehouse. If you want to get fucked, go to court. <laughs> okay? So, you know, the law, the law is, is, is it's, a, it's a beautiful thing when you read it on its face. A lot of times it's facially neutral. However, as applied, it doesn't, well, a lot of times it doesn't work out the same way it works out in the books. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put a pin in that real quick and ask you this. With our people, we hear that and we think to ourselves, well, I can't defend myself. I, oh, excuse me. I can't own a firearm and I'm not going to keep a firearm because then 
I can't defend myself because if I pull that gun out, I'm going to jail regardless, whether it's legal. I've got my air quotations up, legal or not. So what is your your response to that? Do you prefer jail or the morgue? Exactly. Training and education. What's your your preference? Mm -hmm. Oh, my, my life is more valuable than anything right. I know. Exactly. Right. So right. I don't care what it is. And that's my answer. That would be my answer <laughs> do, to do them. You, do you prefer jail or the morgue? I could. At least I have a fighting chance right. with jail. I got. I got. I got. A, I got a shot. Right. But I'm not just. I'm not just going to volunteer for this dirt nap. I'd rather be judged by twelve. Was it judged by judged twelve, by 12 than, 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 by than to be six. carried and by six? And that was yeah. something that was indoctrinated in federal law enforcement. A lot of federal law enforcement got that messaging pounded into them. Mm-hmm. And that's how they proceeded to police America with that mentality. So now they got all the gear, all the weapons, all the training, and this mentality of, I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. While we over here talking about change going to come. Shout out to Sam <laughs> Cook. But it was a good record. But a great about, record. Right. Yeah, yeah. Not, you know, but that's... But that's the thing. So, you know, it's. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, you know, either you want either you want to be food or you don't. That's that's, your, that's it. Can I ask a real quick question, mm-hmm. Antonio? How old are you? Ooh, I'm getting old now. I'm four. I'll be forty. What's it? What day? Is it? Today is the 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 four, the sixteenth. Sixteenth. I'll be forty two in nine days. Okay, yeah. and I know how Younger old you me. are because I'm not going to ask a, a, a lady her age. I don't care because I don't look it. I'm fifty two. All right, and I'm fifty two also. Our, we're, we're Gen Xers. Sir. Mm-hmm. Okay. A lot of what our parents, and this, this I'm, I'm trying to always keep this on, on topic. A lot of what our, our parents and, and a lot of our parents were, were boomers, mm-hmm. I, I want to think. You know, my mom is, is 72. Um, how they got down is not how we get down. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that to, to, in a disrespectful way. Because we all stand on the on the shoulders of giants. We stand on Malcolm. We stand on Martins. We stand on Hueys. Mm-hmm. Okay, but the 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 kneeling and the praying and the hoping part. I think after after civil rights, it just kind of went. We didn't get that. We didn't get that talk. I suppose because the seventies when we when everybody started getting jobs when everybody started um, overcoming. Mm-hmm. You know. We just said, well, okay, um, that's cool, but here comes here comes the crack ac- epidemic, and you know we're back to square one, and we we think differently. And I'm hearing that today. It's like, I, I, yeah, I, I'm I don't want you to be a victim. I don't want to be a victim. I'm a, I'm gonna carry some protection. And our 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 parents are saying, don't do that, you know. And I guess it's a, it's a it's a programming. And that's why I think that's, that's why I think Nam was so good for black men. And people say that's people say it. They like people are like, what the hell is he talking about? That's blasphemy. You said oh, what now? I said that's why I think Nam was so mm-hmm. no, I, beneficial I, for black men. I I, 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 I agree and disagree with you. Don't know. Yeah, my father. Vietnam. My father was, my father was a Nam vet. My father was a Nam vet, and he was drafted. He didn't volunteer, hmm. but <laughs> my dad ran. Wait, wait, <laughs> no, my he fa- didn't, my he didn't fa- run. <laughs> my father was a Nam vet, and he's a highly decorated Nam vet. He got hmm. six medals in Nam. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that Nam introduced black men to a concept of parabellum, which eliminated Mm. that fear, per se, or that conditioning about firearms. Counselor, could you explain what the word parabellum means? (laughs) I know what it means, but I'm going to let him answer because we're going to have to wrap it up, too. Okay. Sure. I mean, in in the most colloquial terms, parabellum is is chaos, Armageddon, warfare, right? Mm -hmm. All out warfare. And so... You know, out of necessity to survive, a lot of these men, you know, had to strip their preconceived notions about anything related to firearms and all of that type of stuff and docility if they wanted to survive. And so when they came back, now they came back with some other issues. That's true. My father's 100% Mm -hmm. disabled because he's got PTSD and all that other stuff. But, you know, the simple fact of the matter is, is that my father was the first person to introduce me to firearms. He was the first person. And, you know, some of my uncles and different things that were also involved in, in Vietnam, they no longer had that fear. They were like, okay, this is this is how we gotta get down. This right. is how this is how this works. Is that mm-hmm. that militancy? Abs- absolutely. Yeah. And so as we um 
Well, first of all, I want to thank all y'all for the discussion too. Sure. And as we get ready to uh, wrap it up, I'm Kia, I'm gonna let you start off because you was getting ready to say something anyway. No, no, I'm just trying to wrap it up. Yeah. Was there a question? No, 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 no. I'm just, I was thanking you all for just being on this panel and discussion to talk about the psychological impact of it. But I'm going to give you the, let you have a final thought. Because you're you about to say something off of what? Well, yeah, Sean what Sean saying. said was very, um, that was telltale for me. Mm -hmm. Your relatives came back after the shit hit the fan. They understood that in order to survive, you got to do what you need to do. They didn't come back and start running around shooting people, but mm -hmm. they'll say, damned if I get shot mm -hmm. without me going out without a fight. And that is kind of the gist of what we, I believe we've been talking about. Our fellow Americans of color have had it very, very safe and cushiony here. Mm -hmm. They've got fairly decent jobs. Yes, we're all, a lot of us are a couple of paychecks out to being on the street, even though we look like we've got it made, but we are richer than 90, was it 85% of the whole planet. If you're not doing well in the United States, you're still richer than most people on the planet. And we've also been indoctrinated to say, guns are not for me. I'm an, well, I, I, I'm not an American, I'm an African American, and mm. I've been told to think I'm a slave, or I'm, I'm from slavery. So this isn't for me, that isn't for me, that's for them. They control, they're always winning, we're always losing. We need to march, we need to pray, we need to protest. But, though, but just as Sean said, we're not winning. I don't do what I do to hurt others. I do what I do so that others don't hurt me. Amen to that. Eric, you got a final thought you want to add to the topic? To quote the Bible, <laughs> Sean's like, ooh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, we had our general meeting today before this podcast, and it was brought up by me, but, you know, we had the discussion about this, this the gun violence thing, yeah. Um, and and our vice president of of Naga, Doug, said something that I, I remember. Says I, I'm not going to deny that it that it does you know that it doesn't happen. I, and I had this conversation with my wife. We, it got a little heated. You know, I'm never going to deny it, but I'm going to do everything in my power as a man, as a father, as a husband, to keep the wolf at bay. And I have good friends. I mean, people that I, I, I genuinely love that feel like, well, you know, guns are evil and we need to, to decrease the amount of guns in our neighborhood, but it's never, never said past that. Well, how, mm -hmm. well, why, and you know, what should we do? And it's always toward the legal gun owners, always toward the people that are responsible or want to do right and protect their families. So it's just like, well, why are you taking from me? I'm, I'm just, you know, and then we have California, we have New York, we have Connecticut, Illinois. We have these, these places that truly do, but then what? Crime don't stop. Now, I don't have a, it's a, I don't have a solution. I really don't. But I'm at the point now where I'm past trying to find a solution and I'm pro- me, pro, my family, pro, anybody that wants to be like me, think like me, not just look like me, and you want to go in the, in the direction that we all can go to be safe, live these fruitful, long lives, then I'm with that, you know? Everything else is just deck chairs on the Titanic at this point. So I, but to my question earlier, I'm done trying to convince people about why I should be able to defend myself I'm just, I'm done. You know, I'm going to take the ones that want to come. You know, you, we like, like, again, quote the Bible, you know, everybody ain't going to get to the promised land. And I'm okay with that. But if you want to get to the promised land, hey, there's organizations that, that we can, we can use. So. <clears throat> Lions on the Serengeti 
are born as lions. Zebras on the Serengeti are born as zebras. They don't get an opportunity to choose. We are in a fortunate position to where we get the opportunity to choose. And if you choose to be a zebra, then you cannot complain when the lion makes you his dinner. I'm going to say the one thing I've learned from being a Gen Xer, as you were saying, Eric, I learned from my parents, even though they've been docile when it comes to guns within our community, I learned a lot from them because my parents, some of my family members still live on the land that they worked on as slaves. And one thing I learned from being on that land and growing up on it every time, every now and then playing with my cousins is I would never be a victim. So anything I got to do to protect my family and to make sure my family is safe I would, they would never put me behind any chains and I would go out fighting all day, every day. And that's if I can do anything to teach anybody that is to make sure that you protect your life because your life is the most valuable thing that you have and you protect your family because that's what you're going to need to endure in life. And then you protect anybody else that's around you that you love. So thank you all again for being on this panel. It was a great conversation. I'm glad we talked about psychological impacts, whether it was taking place within in the fears within the black community. Uh, thank you all for tuning in to this podcast. You know, please leave your comments down below. And make sure y'all subscribe to the channel for future episodes coming out. So y'all be blessed, be peace, and we'll see y'all in the next episode. Peace. Thank you for tuning in to Thank this you. week's episode of the Bass Rees Gun Club podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Don't forget to like and comment on the show to let us know what you think. And if you're interested in learning more about firearm safety, proficiency, and the shooting sports, and you're in the Atlanta area, please consider joining the Bass Rees Gun Club. We are a pro-Second Amendment community of responsibly armed citizens, and we take pride in learning and sharing our knowledge within the community. You can find more about us and how to join at BassReevesGC.com. That's BassReevesG as in Gary, C as in Gary, SeasonCat.com. Remember, stay fearless knowing no master but duty. I am Antonio Hicks, and it's been my privilege to produce and edit this podcast, bringing these important conversations to life. But the conversation doesn't have to end here. If you're curious about more stories and insights in the avenue of politics, technology, and gaming, I invite you to join me on my own podcast, PTG TV. On PTG TV, we dive deep into a variety of topics exploring the intricacies of our world with a mix of humor, seriousness, and everything in between. It's a space where we challenge norms, celebrate diversity, and foster a community of curious minds and open hearts. You can find PTG TV on all major podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Just search for PTG TV and hit subscribe. All opinions expressed by the podcast host, participants, and creators are their own and do not reflect the opinions of NAGA, the Bass Reeves Gun Club, which is the Atlanta chapter of NAGA or affiliated gun ranges, gun clubs, or companies.